Nick, one of the things we've seen in 2025 is an explosion of interest and concern about the spread of uh, AI and data centers, which are required, driving up the uh, demand growth for, for electricity. But your analysis suggests that even with that extra demand coming on stream, renewables are still even growing faster yet. Yes, so we have just looked at our numbers and put our forecast out for our expectation for cap capacity deployment for solar and for wind for, for 2025. And we have another step up in solar capacity deployment on top of the already pretty enormous record numbers that we've saw, seen last year, so 9% uh, growth rate in just the capacity added. And uh, on the wind side, it's even larger to step up with a 21% increase. So this year, we're already expecting that generation growth will keep pace with electricity demand growth. Um, specifically, most of that is coming from solar and wind, which together actually already uh, match electricity demand. You don't even have to look further towards nuclear and hydro, which are kind of balancing each other out this year. So yeah, we're already matching the same pace and we're still seeing a step up in the capacity deployment. And the two are kind of, they're, they're obviously very closely related, but on a little bit of a lag. So capacity deployment comes first and then generation increases follow if you just look at them on an annual basis. So basically that fast capacity deployment means we're already expecting another step up in clean generation growth next year. Um Obviously, it's really hard to predict what demand is going to do. Uh, data centers are certainly part of that, part of the uncertainty. But so is uh, are just regular temperatures. Are we going to get a hot summer in the US? Are we going to get a mild winter in China? They play a big role in in determining cooling and heating demand, and those fluctuate on a yearly basis. So we really have to kind of wait and see what the specific number for next year's is. Next year's, but on a structural basis we're certainly at a point where, where clean power is growing fast enough. That's a, that's a really important point, a structural demand. Uh, the market structure is changing at a global level and it's changing, of course, as we talked about in previous interviews, faster in some economies like in China and India and slower in other, in other economies. But nevertheless, it's changing. And the idea that we've gone, we're no longer going to be tied to the fossil fuel uh, boom and bust cycle, that now we're, this is a structural change in global energy markets is, uh, it, it's, I know it's been coming for a while, but is it fair to say that we have passed that point, that inflection point, we're now into structural change? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we are, if you look at it just from a fossil fuel perspective, could, from a from a renewables perspective, you've just looked at increasing growth every single year. I mean, solar growth rates this year in the first three quarters, uh, which, we're, which we've reported on with a, um, recent, in our recent Q3 global power report, solar power's generation is growing at 31% a year. Now that growth rate is always, we always expect it to drop next year and then it never drops. Uh, it's actually one of the highest growth rates that we've seen in, in the last in the last few years, uh, even though the absolute growth is much, much higher, that's usually not something you see from mature industries. Solar power, the technology is very mature, but the improvements in both technology and deployment costs are still so good that uh, we still see, yeah, 31% year on year growth rates, which is quite remarkable. But yeah, so given, given, given that we have this, this pace of deployment on the renewable side, the story is very clear. If you look at it from a fossil fuel perspective, you've essentially had the first half of the, or you, you've had kind of, I guess the first decade in the 2000s where any growth in electricity demand essentially means large increases in fossil generation. You then move into you know, far some increases in hydro generation and nuclear, but they usually used to be relatively minor in that period. You then move into sort of 2010 to 2015 and you're starting to see wind power pushing into the market a little bit more. And that means from a fossil generation perspective, you're still seeing demand increases, but they're getting a little bit smaller. And then from 2015 onwards, you have solar power really entering the market at scale. And especially since sort of 2020, 2021, reaching much higher levels. And basically within, within 10 years, you've gone from, from, just from a fossil perspective, you've gone from Every single demand growth is a very clear sign that our industry is going to grow 
to where we are now, where basically you're working with stagnation as your base case scenario, and you're looking at increasing costs for your operations. Drilling is not going to get much easier. Availability for oil isn't necessarily something that 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 increases over time. Obviously, you know, new oil wells will be discovered and new drilling techniques will be will be found, I'm sure. But you're operating on a stagnation base case and ask any investor if they're interested in a stagnating industry and they'll probably tell you that's not where they're going to put their money. So stagnation really is the kind of the 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 leading word that the fossil industry will have to follow. I'm really glad you brought up the history of this over the last you know, 20, 25 years because, uh, and I know you guys do this at, at Ember Energy, but here at Energy Media, we use you know S-curves to explain technology adoption. I mean, and these are not new. I used them 40 years ago when I was doing my, my graduate work. But the, the point for those who haven't heard me expound on this before in the audience, I apologize. But basically any new technology gets on the bottom of the S-curve is sort of, if you think of it as a, as an S, so at the far left-hand corner, and then the progress in the first uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years is very, very slow as it goes from left to right. But then it gets to the bend in the S-curve, the inflection point. And that's where it becomes cost competitive and has a higher value and so on, a lower risk than the its competitors. And it begins to move into the market in a bigger way. It begins to push, eventually push out the old technology and take higher and higher market share. And I'm glad you brought up 2020 because that seems to be the date, you know, 2021, 2019, whatever, but around that period where all of the major technologies on the, uh, you know, wind, solar, batteries, electric vehicles, heat pumps, and digital controls and so on, all seem to have passed their inflection point right about that period. So we're only like four, four to six years into the point where those technologies have become really competitive. And yet the speed at which they're roaring up the hockey stick part of that S curve now is just astonishing. And, and I think we need that framework to help my audience understand why this is going to continue, why we're not going to see cycles anymore, why fossil fuels will eventually begin to decline. It's because the technologies that are their competitors have now passed the S point, uh, S curve, the inflection point in the S curve, and now we're into structural change in the global energy system. Have I, have I, is that a reasonable way to look at this? Absolutely. Yes. So in, in 2020, 2021 is exactly around the time where Irina and others assess that solar power is now the cheapest source of new electricity. So the inflection, the fact that the inflection point happens around that time is, is no accident. It's, it's always, almost always with new technologies, it's a cost question. So if you think about the story of solar, when it first burst onto the scene, uh, we're talking largely about a market in Germany and in Spain with heavy subsidies, but really popularizing a technology and, and bringing it forward many decades, potentially. So um, I might be biased because I'm German, but I, I'm, I'm glad that Germany kind of took the hit on, on bringing this technology to market and accelerating its, its development. You saw a similar, similar development with EVs as well, where costs were relatively high, the entry to market was difficult, and it took a few, a, a few companies that really kind of took a gamble on EVs, went all in, brought the cost down for everyone else as well, and really laid the groundwork. That work is really important. It's not enough to make a structural change. So the structural change comes when we just get to the point where enough people do enough work, there's enough investment, the costs fall just enough to the right point that you go, go beyond the early adopters, the more affluent population, and you go into a more broad uh, consumer sphere. Or in the case of solar power, where utilities see solar as the, the necessary option to keep up with, let's say, power demand in Texas. If you reach that point, then your cost competitiveness kind of takes over. You get increasing improvement in the technology. You get new solar cells, higher efficiency, lower costs for battery systems, uh, both in terms of production and delivery. And then it kind of snowballs from there. And that's exactly where we then get to that structural change. And something that's really important here, if we look at that recent IA CPS scenario that was reported so widely everywhere, 
one of the big assumptions, and it's not a forecast, it's a scenario, but one of the big assumptions that we feel is has really missed the mark is that it essentially assumes that all of that technological change that has been there for so many technologies in the past, including for coal 120 years ago and for gas 60, 70 years ago, all of those developments are now going to stop. That's the assumption in the scenario is that technological change is going to stop, the cost curves are going to stop, battery systems aren't going to get any better, EV sales in India are going to stay the same now uh, until 2050. So it's I know it's just a scenario, not a forecast, but if anyone wants to use it as a credible forecast, then they uh, they should look at the underlying assumptions and they don't tell a very pretty story. I have an anecdote about that that'll shed a little light here, uh, Nick. I interviewed Michael Liebrich a few years ago, and he was the founder of Bloomberg, uh, well, New Energy Finance, which became Bloomberg, NEF. And in, I think it was 2009, I may have my dates wrong, but I think it was, he sold his model, his energy demand model, to the International Energy Agency, and they incorporated it into their big computer model. And as part of that process, he got to take a little peek under the hood of the IEA's model. And one of the things that struck him is that the IEA does only allows exponential growth in its model for two or three years. And then it, it assumes that it'll go back to some kind, of either plateau or very slow linear growth. And the reason for that is because if you continue to grow at exponential levels for wind and solar and batteries and EVs and so on, you get disruption and change in the economy that would be very disturbing to the members of the, uh, you know, the, like the United States uh, who don't like to hear that. So you put a break on your, on your scenario, uh, on your model, uh, so that it doesn't appear too radical and too disturbing which is why the IEA has undershot uh, its uh, forecast for uh, solar adoption and, you know, pick a, t a clean technology. They've undershot on all of them. And that's one of the things that, that uh, explains exactly what you're talking about. And that is that it's built into the model that the, that growth only, ha rapid growth only happens a couple of years and then it tapers off and it plateaus. And that's part of, and that's why their modeling is actually much more conservative, not the radical thing that the U.S. and and the oil and gas companies are saying is the case. Yeah, and if we look at the other scenarios that usually come out along alongside, so the the standard one that sort of the, I'd say the conservative base case, so the slightly pessimistic base case is the step scenarios, so the stated policies, and then usually we also get the announced pledges scenario, the APS. Uh, which unfortunately this year hasn't come out yet because not enough countries have renewed their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions or their updates to their climate policy, which understandably meant that there wasn't really much to go off of for that scenario, but it will be produced soon. And generally speaking, the APS scenario, which is the most um, out, of the, out of the normative scenarios that are not looking to a specific policy objective like net zero or um, or energy access for all, which are kind of the the endpoint scenarios where you're looking to get to a specific point. Out of the three scenarios, CPS steps and APS, APS is the one that historically has had the best performance on solar deployment. Um, and in general, like if you make a model in sort of a in a vacuum, it does make sense to put constraints on your model, and and especially with exponential growth. Uh, if you go too many years, you can get into spheres where your electricity generation from solar grows way beyond the total electricity demand in the world and then just keeps going. So in some constraints certainly make sense. Uh, but I think it's pretty evident, given the underperformance on the solar forecast, that those constraints have been uh, overworked for quite a long time. And uh, yeah, the, the fact that the coverage of the recent World Energy Outlook uh, didn't really account for that, and a lot of um, a lot of coverage was honing in on the less than less than uh, ideal CPS scenario. is um, is a little bit of a shame. Oh, Nick, uh, I'll I'll wrap up the interview uh, by noting for our audience that uh, last week, uh, Energy Media published a Stubstack Energy essay, which I think is 
rather unique in, in um, you know, energy analysis, where we compared the assumptions behind all of the major uh, energy demand models like OPEC, IEA steps, and so on, and then compared the, the assumptions to what was happening in the real world. And what we found is exactly what you said, which is the IEA's APS scenario best matches the evidence on the ground in and the data that we're seeing. And so what that means, folks, is that if you're, especially if you're in North America, and especially if you're in Canada, is that when the APS says that, that or models that uh, global oil demand will fall from 103 million barrels a day today to 55 million barrels a day by 2050, LNG and gas demand will fall off a cliff starting in 2035. That has major, major implications for en national energy policies and national investment, private and public investment in oil and gas infrastructure. And so I'm going to include a link to that essay in the video description, and I'd encourage you to read it because it, it provides a basis, a foundation for what Nick and I have been talking about in this interview. So thank you very much for this, Nick. Really appreciate it. Welcome. Thanks for having me.